Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to stay in touch, let us know what you like, and help support our work on Patreon. We appreciate you. There has been a lot of concern about the threat of space-based nuclear weapons. Recently, a U.S. politician leaked to the media that Russia might be placing a nuclear weapon in orbit, so it could be detonated over the United States at any time. This is not an idle threat. In 1962, the United States was worried about the potential of a nuclear weapon detonated at high altitude or low Earth orbit. In keeping with American military doctrine, when we are afraid of something terrible happening to us, we usually do it somewhere else first. On the 9th of July, 1962, the United States launched a nuclear-armed Thor rocket from the Johnston Atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There aren't many places controlled by the United States where you can do something brand new and a little crazy. The Johnston Atoll is part of the Marshall Islands. Some of you will recognize this as the launch site chosen by SpaceX for the Falcon 1. Because if something goes wrong, there aren't very many people around. The Thor rocket system had a mass of about 50 metric tons and was roughly 20 meters tall and two and a half wide. The Thor was carrying a W-49 thermonuclear warhead. Thermonuclear means that an atomic bomb is used as a fuse to create the conditions necessary for deuterium and tritium to fuse, creating a small star for just a few microseconds. We've known how to make fusion reactions for a long time. Controlling them for peaceful purposes is the hard part. The W-49 was produced between 1958 and 1965 at Los Alamos. It had a mass of 740 kilograms or 1,640 pounds, with a maximum blast yield of about 1.45 megatons. To put things in perspective, this is almost 100 times the power of the 15 kiloton bomb dropped on Hiroshima two decades before. All this from a device that was 54 inches or 1.38 meters tall and 20 inches or 51 centimeters wide. The Thor climbed to an altitude of 250 miles or about 400 kilometers, the exact average altitude of the International Space Station, and detonated. What you are seeing right now is not a sunrise. It is the result of Operation Starfish Prime, as seen from Honolulu, Hawaii. 900 miles or 1,450 kilometers away from the blast. Here is an eyewitness report. At 0900 GMT, a brilliant white flash burned through the clouds rapidly, changing to an expanding green ball of irradiance, extending into the clear sky above the overcast. From its surface extruded great white fingers, resembling cirrostratus clouds, which rose to 40 degrees above the horizon in sweeping arcs, turning downward toward the poles and disappearing in seconds, to be replaced by spectacular concentric cirrus-like rings, moving out from the blast at tremendous initial velocity, finally stopping when the outermost ring was 50 degrees overhead. They did not disappear, but persisted in a state of frozen stillness. All this occurred, I would judge, within 45 seconds. As the purplish light turned to magenta and began to fade at the point of burst, a bright red glow began to develop on the horizon, at a direction 50 degrees north of east, and simultaneously 50 degrees south of east, expanding inward and upward until the whole eastern sky was a dull burning red semicircle, 100 degrees north to south and halfway to the zenith, obliterating some of the lesser stars. This condition, interspersed with tremendous rainbows, persisted no less than 90 minutes. End quote. Most of the damage created by nuclear warheads is caused by the superheated supersonic shock wave that travels through the atmosphere. In space, this high above the atmosphere, this effect is very minor. But a nuclear blast does create a very powerful electromagnetic pulse. An electromagnetic pulse is a very strong and rapidly expanding magnetic field. When a magnetic field moves past a conductor, like electrical wires and telephone and power systems, electronics, or computer chips, it generates an electric current. If the pulse has enough power, it can burn out integrated chips and control systems, exploding transformers and melting wires. The Carrington event in the late 1800s was the result of an EMP from a coronal mass ejection from the sun as it impacted the Earth's magnetic field. 
the pulse melted telegraph wires, destroyed equipment, and set buildings on fire around the earth. Starfish Prime caused damage to Hawaii's electrical power systems, blowing out over 300 streetlights, and shut down telephone communications. If it had been detonated over the island state itself, it would have done much, much more. Starfish Prime injected over 175 billion watts of energy into the Earth's magnetosphere. Some of the particles increased the intensity of the Van Allen radiation belts around the Earth. There weren't very many satellites in orbit back then, but three of the few we did have in low Earth orbit were destroyed, including the world's first telecommunications satellite, Telstar, owned by the United Kingdom. A modern nuclear weapon with the same power as Starfish Prime, hidden aboard a large satellite, by Putin or some other world dictator, and placed into orbit over the United States, could, if detonated, do much more damage today. Every automobile built after the early 1980s would be vulnerable to this attack, as would every computer, cell phone, and all electronics. Power grids would fail, cities would go dark, power stations and transformers would explode or catch fire, and there would be no way to notify fire departments to respond to them, as no one would be able to call for help or report crimes. The entire United States would be set back two centuries in an instant. But don't think for a second that this would be smart for Russia or anyone else to do. If Starfish Prime taught America anything, it was the near impossibility of preventing such an attack on our modern nation, either by an orbital weapon or an ICBM-launched bomb, or perhaps one carried on a high-altitude airplane. But make no mistake, this would be an act of war, and the American nuclear triad exists to make sure that everyone knows that anyone doing this will be wiped off the face of the earth mere minutes later. All of America's nuclear arsenal is hardened against this type of attack, as are the delivery systems. America's ICBMs and hardened communication systems would still work perfectly, as would America's nuclear-powered and armed submarines and bombers, sending hypersonic retribution to our enemies. No one would be this stupid not even the man who chose to attack the Texas of Europe. Also, a nuclear weapon in orbit would not have enough shielding to evade detection. We would know when it went up, from the X-rays and gamma rays being emitted. And we might have something, an uncrewed robotic space plane, for instance, that would get it and bring it back for inspection, landing it on a remote military base in the middle of an ocean. Once again, no one is this stupid. So why did a U.S. politician try to terrify the American public about this threat, which we have known about for half a century? The U.S. Congress is trying to modify the Foreign Intelligence Gathering Program called Section 702. What is Section 702? According to some, it is a necessary intelligence gathering tool of the U.S. government. To others, it is a violation of the Constitution and the privacy rights of American citizens. The FBI has been caught abusing its Section 702 authority to spy on American citizens for political targeting more than 278,000 times since the data gathering started after September 11, 2001. Scaring the public is a well-known tactic to get them to give up their liberties. It has worked throughout history. But I will leave you with a phrase from the Pennsylvania Assembly's reply to the governor prior to the Revolutionary War. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety, deserve neither liberty nor safety. These words are attributed to a member of that assembly, named Benjamin Franklin. Something to think about. Hello, fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible, to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. 
Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. To take this channel to the next level will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astro Proterra.